Good afternoon, members and public. We'll call to order the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development. Today is Monday, March 6th, March 18th. We have a quorum, and a quorum is present. As usual, I always like to start off by letting everyone know what the, our roadmap is today and what we have going on. Uh, today we'll be hearing uh, Senate File 4172 from Senator French, and then we'll hear a bonding project request overview from Deed, a bonded request, uh, a project from the IRRB, which is uh, Iron Range Rehabilitation and uh, Iron Range Resource and Rehabilitation Board. I, I got to do these things even in my head, Commissioner. Um, and then we also uh, hear Senate File 3756 from Senator Hochschild, who will join us on Zoom today. And then also Senate File 4925 from Senator Putnam. Uh, and Senate File 3164 from our Vice Chair, Senator Muhammad. And you may have seen on Senator Muhammad's bill that there is a, 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 a delete all amendment. And so we hope that you would take a look at that so that you uh, will know what's happening there and we can certainly talk a little more about it when we get to that point. Mem members of the public and those who are identified as testifiers on our agenda, our rule is that the that the a Senate author can take as much time as they want, but we encourage them to be brief. Uh, and any testifiers, you only get two minutes. And we time you to make sure of that because we like to be fair and equitable. If you're one of those long-winded individuals that need a little reminder, we don't mind giving you a gentle nudge by saying your time is up, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, a, a big reason for that is because we like for um, all testifiers to sort of build upon each other and not simply just repeat each other. So thank you so much for understanding that. And as you can tell that we have a full agenda today, so we will, uh, 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 again, uh, go forward. So Senator Friends, you are there at the table and you can begin your, your presentation of Senate File 4172 and um, former Representative Marty Seaford. I see that you've come up to the testifier's table already, so I don't have to... Uh, uh, um, Beckon for you to come forward. So, Senator Friends, it is, we are here and you can present. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you and the members for hearing Senate File 4172, a very simple bill. We're uh, conforming to changes that the federal government made, uh, um, which divides our Centers for Independent Living, and essentially I'm asking for you to pass Senate File 4172 for conforming language. I have Marty Seifert here to testify, but what we are doing, members, is that to conform to the federal support for these independent living centers, they have changed the language, and we need to conform in that same way. The change essentially boils down to um, that the name of it in the federal legislation is different. I'll let Mr. Seifert talk a little bit about that. Mr. Chair and members, I know of no opposition to this and simply brings us into conformity so that these centers, which perform a valuable service to keep Minnesotans who need help with independent living, can be done. I also want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for accommodating my schedule. I got to run over and uh, chair the other hour and 27 minutes of the Energy Committee when we're done here. With that, I'd like to have Mr. Seifert testify briefly, please. Thank you, Senator Friends and former Representative uh, Seifert. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senators, uh, my name is Marty Seifert. I uh, represent the Minnesota Association for Centers for Independent Living. I want to thank Senator Friends for uh, authoring our bill. Across Minnesota, there's eight nonprofits certified as Centers for Independent Living. Each provide federally mandated non-residential independent services in our local communities. And they're open for any person with a disability of any sort. Centers in Minnesota are partially funded under Title VII of the Rehabilitation Act as amended by the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act which some years ago was transferred Center for Independent Living programs from the U.S. Department of Education to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under the Administration for Community Living. Uh, Senator Francis' bill proposed to amend the state statute to reflect the move and provide clarity as to the standard and assurances that our centers must comply with under the Rehab Act. Centers have worked with DEED to make sure that these changes are appropriate and that they come from the federal government in compliance. The bill is prepared in partnership with the Vo Vocational Rehabilitation Service 
Services Department. We know of no opposition or controversy. Our centers are located in Moorhead, Sauk Rapids, East Grand Fork, St. Paul, Rochester, Marshall, and of course Mankato, where my uh, niece receives services uh, in Senator Francis' district. With that, I'll stand for any questions, Mr. Chair. So I should have said Seifert instead of Seifert. I'm so used to screwing your name up. So I've been apologies. called worse, Mr. Chair. Uh, any questions uh, for the testifier or Senator Friends? Seeing that, any closing comments there, Senator Friend? No, uh, again, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know you have a full agenda. Members, I hope you'll look favorably on this bill. We're simply trying to have our Centers for Independent Living continue to provide the services for Minnesotans that need them and have language that conforms to the change in federal law. Uh, with that being said, Senate File 4172 will be, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. <laughs> members, we will now proceed to uh, now we'll proceed to the deed overview of their bonding projects. Um, again, just so that you know, and we'll ask, as I'm making, uh, uh, giving this explanation again, that we'll ask for um, the committee to understand that, again, according to the process, when an agency has a bonding project, Senator Pappas asks us to, to listen to it so we can make recommendations to her as to whether we think it's a good idea or bad idea. So traditionally, we do not hear capital investments uh, projects, but that is the justification for the two that you're going to hear today. Uh, with that being said, uh, we have Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon come, uh, come forward, and he's going to walk us through these uh, bonding project requests. And... Uh, uh, great uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, who I often ref refer to as the TC, if you'll be so, so kind as to state your name for the record and proceed with your brief presentation. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair uh, and members. My name is Kevin McKinnon. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Economic Development uh, at DEED. And here today uh, to discuss our capital budget request. Uh, we have two items uh, that we are asking for, totaling $5 million for two statutory programs that, that we run that utilize general obligation bonds to help uh, support our communities with their development goals. The Business Development Public Infrastructure Grant Program, uh, BDPI, uh, and our Transportation Economic Development Infrastructure Program, or what we call TEDI, uh, for $2 million. So the first uh, program uh, is our BDPI program, where um, this is a, a grant program that we provide funding to local units of government to uh, essentially lower the cost of development and support um, uh, business projects in communities. Uh, this program is only available outside of the seven county metro area, uh, and we cover 50% of the eligible costs uh, for the infrastructure project. Communities uh, will, will be providing infrastructure to support a development, so think wastewater, um, water lines, uh, road connections, etc. cetera. Uh, and we may only give a community up to $2 million every two years. Uh, it's really for uh, industrial uses, uh, so think manufacturing and warehousing, uh, et cetera. And as mentioned, uh, it helps to lower the cost of development uh, for our communities in greater Minnesota. Um, these, this program is also um, run on a rolling basis, so as our communities have projects, they come to us uh, with an application and then we make awards. So a good example of a project that we recently completed was Lineage Logistics in Laverne. Uh, we provided a, a, almost a half million dollars uh, for some street and utility work that needed to be done to support a very large investment uh, that you can see for Laverne, $50 million, 75 new jobs, and, and quite a substantial facility. So as it relates to our budget, uh, in BDPI last year we received $10 million in GO uh, bonds, uh, and in addition we also receive uh, about $2 million uh, every year in general fund money. So we had about $12 million to start. Our current balance is about $7 million in this, pro in this program. Uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, applications come in on a rolling basis. We have a few that are in there right now, uh, and uh, we could use uh, another $3 million to get us through this next year. 
The second uh, program that we have is our Transportation Economic Development Infrastructure Program, or TEDI. Uh, this is a joint effort uh, with MnDOT, uh, where uh, we collaborate on the applications. Uh, MnDOT obviously contributes a lot uh, relative to safety and, and other improvements that are being made. Um, but this uh, program essentially supports our local communities with the local costs that are needed to support transportation uh, uh, investment projects. Uh, again, uh, this program uh, is, a, actually this program is available statewide. Uh, we're asking for $2 million in this and we cover costs such as pre-design, land acquisition, construction, et cetera, uh, for the local improvements that lead to either an interchange or rerouting of roads, et cetera. Uh, we do one RFP a year uh, for this and uh, essentially accept applications and, uh, and make awards with the available money that we have. So a good uh, example of this uh, program is uh, a grant we did in a million dollars to the city of Dayton. Uh, this helped them uh, with some local uh, connection points to the interchange on I-94. Uh, it uh, obviously is uh, important to us as, a, as it relates to the industrial park that is very close there. Safety for a lot of the trucks and things that would go in and out of that uh, industrial park. Uh, but a significant uh, a number of businesses that are uh, locating there and uh, more to come through this uh, program as well. So as far as our balance uh, in this program, we had uh, two million uh, with last year's appropriation. Uh, and uh, we are about to uh, make awards uh, and spend all of that money, so we're asking for an additional two million dollars uh, in, in the capital uh, budget uh, this year to uh, for us to do another grant round this fall. Those are our two uh, requests in the capital investment budget, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon. Any questions to the uh, testifier about the projects, or if you have any thoughts, if you have any concerns, uh, anything? Seeing that we have no questions around the table, or articulated concerns, we, we will communicate with uh, Senator Pappas uh, that we think that uh, these projects appear to be uh, uh, worth it and viable, and then they have to go through the tough decision as to whether they have enough uh, money in their uh, 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 area. With that being said, thank you so very much, Commissioner. We appreciate you as usual, and we appreciate all the work of DEED. Thanks, Mr. Chair and members. Members, next we will go to Commissioner Rukavina, who's going to walk us through the IRRB's bonding request, and I, it looks like she has Shar Conger to speak to the uh, Minnesota Discovery Center's bonding request, and we will let the commissioner lead us in this discussion. Uh, needless to say, welcome to the, to the city and welcome to the committee. We're appreciative of each and every one of you. So please state your name for the record, Commissioner, and proceed with your presentation and guide us as to uh, which uh, person that you want to speak. Welcome, Commissioner Rukavina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ida Rukavina. I'm the Commissioner of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation. Um, thank you for having us today. I'll present first and then I will turn it over to Shar for a, um, a different presentation. So thank you to the committee for having us um, present this project today um, regarding our agency's capital budget request. The agency's request for $12 million includes critical infrastructure replacement at Giants Ridge Recreation Area, specifically the Legend Golf Course, which is a state-owned asset in northeastern Minnesota. Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation and Giants Ridge um, have not received previous state bonding um, funds for this project, and the project is specifically $12 million for inf irrigation infrastructure replacement and design. Uh, Giants Ridge, located in northeastern Minnesota um, in Biwabic, um, situated um, on the east end of the Iron Range. Um, and Giants Ridge is located in a depressed region of the state and is economically disadvantaged due to the downturn in mining since the 1980s. Uh, Giants Ridge does provide diversification of jobs and tourism in the region. It is a key economic driver in this region, um, and these needed investments are vital for the future survival of the region and the quality of life it provides for the local residents and visitors from across Minnesota, the U.S., and Canada. 
Giants Ridge provides jobs, direct and indirect economic impacts. It attracts visitors to the region who spend money there. It improves the quality of life for the people who live there. And Giants Ridge created an average annual economic impact of 55.4 million to the surrounding communities. So the current underground waterline infrastructure system for the Legend Golf Course is 30 years old and it is at the end of its useful life. Prolonging the operation has become very cumbersome and costly with reliability issues becoming increasingly frequent. Components of that original system are difficult to find and often non-existent. Non-existent. Failure of the, lim of the lines due to the system's age would have a negative impact on Giants Ridge and the Iron Range communities that depend on that tourism economy for Gulf visitors. This irrigation infrastructure replacement will sustain the facility's recreational opportunities, lower the facility's water usage, and provide automation and energy efficiencies. You'll see here the current irrigation control boards and box. Um, they're no longer available, new or rebuilt. Um, as other courses upgrade their systems, uh, Giants Ridge is purchasing the other facilities' discarded control boards. If there's a significant lightning strike or power surge, there is no way to repair the current inventory. The irrigation control box shown was purchased from a municipal course in Iowa. Spare parts from decommissioned systems like this are now almost impossible to find. You'll see here the current plastic block valves incorporated into the irrigation system design are now failing and must be replaced with stronger brass valves. The water lines on the current system have been in the ground for 30 years and they have begun to fail due to age and frost heave associated with our climate. So the new irrigation infrastructure outcomes are reduced water consumption. Again, when we're talking about um, you know, utilizing the um, infrastructure and water that we have to the best of our abilities, replacing this will be more efficient. Uh, reduced energy uses. Um, the system includes scheduling and remote control capabilities, allowing the system to run irrigation during off-peak hours when electricity costs are lower, and that would result in energy savings as well. Operation cost savings from reduced utility bills and labor costs associated with the ongoing repairs. Again, those components being almost non-existent, uh, a new system will reduce downturn, downtown on the golf course and labor savings on repairs and equipment. Automation, weather integration software allows real-time weather data to adjust irrigation schedules. Um, you know, obviously this year we are already in a drought in northern Minnesota with fire restrictions. So really using those aligning irrigation with actual weather conditions we feel will be um, more efficient. Remote monitoring uh, will enable quick adjustments and troubleshooting, minimizing water and energy waste. And then just overall greater sustainability of operations the long-term savings in water and energy costs, as well as potential landscape preservation can offer return on investment by reducing water. Uh, sorry, water consumption. Um, and then again, just the overall uh, importance of the investment. Our objective in making this investment is to optimize the beneficial economic and quality of life effects that the legend continues to have on the region. By making this investment right now, we can prevent unnecessary cost escalations caused by inflation, thereby saving substantial amounts of money in the future, potentially um, hundreds of thousands. Furthermore, we aim to avert any major infrastructure breakdown. We're getting nervous again with golf courses opening up this summer and this spring. Um, we would like to avoid those catastrophes and keep people being able to golf and utilize um, our tourism in the area. And that is all I have on that project. So I really want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this project and the agency's capital budget request. Uh, we believe the critical um, infrastructure needs at Giants Ridge can be addressed through this request. And that is all I have, unless there are questions. All right, any questions? Uh, Senator Muhammad. I think Senator Nelson was before me, um, but I'll ask a question. Um, how many people utilize the golf course? Uh, commissioner. Chair, um, Senator, I know that in the last presentations when I come here, usually I have a number of the people, the visitors that travel from all over. I do not know that I have currently in my presentation the exact number of visitors, but I can definitely get that information and respond back to you. 
Um, There's, I can say there are two golf courses, and so this specific infrastructure needs are for the oldest golf course that's located right at um, Giant Switch facility. Senator Mohammed, follow up. And so there are two golf courses? Correct. And one of them is good, and the other one, the older one, is the one that needs this. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I think I'm personally a little concerned about $12 million for a golf course. I know that obviously it's a need for the community, and I appreciate it, but you know, touring the state, the thing that we kept hearing was there are so many communities that need drinking water, and so you know, is there any other way that you guys can finance this in your community um, besides going through the state? Commissioner. Chair, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, you know, we do believe this is in line with water needs and infrastructure for communities. Um, as you, you know, most of you know, the um, Iron Range Resources is funded by um, property tax or production tax in lieu of property taxes by the mining companies. Um, again, we were created so that we could diversify the local economy, and this is one of the ways that we have done that is to increase tourism to the area, bring jobs to the community. Um, around 180 jobs per year are dependent on this, and so people come from all over the nation to come to this golf course, um, stay and utilize local restaurants and local lodging, and so um, it is a state-owned facility, and we do believe that this would be a good use of maintaining this infrastructure because if it does go down, um, you know, just it, it, it'll, it would stop the visitor tourism, um, you know, that would be visiting the golf course at that time. Senator Mohammed, any follow-up? Yeah, I have follow-up. Thank you. So between the two golf courses, how many people are employed on each of them? And then follow-up to that is how many folks come and what is sort of the money that comes in in terms of economy between the two? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rukavina. Chair, Senator, um, thank you. So Giants Ridge, I don't have the breakdown between the, the golf course and the ski season. So what we did it was originally just a ski resort, and then 30 years ago we expanded so that there would be summer um, tourism as well. And so that was when the golf course was created so that it wasn't just a winter sport season. Um, and so Giants Ridge itself has 180 jobs in recreation and, and lodging. Giants Ridge has 135 full-time employees, um, and there's 180 total employees between both you know, the, the whole entire facility, so I don't have the golf course numbers um, specifically broken down. Um, and Giants Ridge itself, again, brings $55.4 million average annual impact to the community. Uh, Senator Mohammed, any follow-up questions? Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, Senator Mohammed started the questioning off, just what I was wondering. So I, too, would like to know, uh, you know, what's the census of use of the golf course, uh, particularly the one that this project is, the, the irrigation project is uh, slated to go to. Uh, so I think that's important to know. And then also I, I was wondering about the um, the IRRRB funding. And so it's a, I'm wondering why the IRRRB funding cannot be used to help with this water project, or this irrigation project. Commissioner Rukavina. Chair, Senator, thank you. Um, as far as the exact numbers of the people that use it, I will have to get back to um, the committee on those because I don't have the breakdown in front of me for the golfing. Um, but I will say, so IRRRB funds can be used for this. A again, um, in our one of our other bonding projects, we received state funds for a state facility and we used a portion of our funds to help um, uh, cover the rest of that. Um, so what I would say is that the IRRR funds come from mining companies. They pay a production tax in lieu of uh, property taxes. So if they were paying property taxes, it would be remaining local to those communities. Um, and so we do use those funds in, in numerous ways across the TACNET assistance area um, on infrastructure, helping cities, um, and usually it's offset with state funds. So when a city comes and says they need water sewer, we might give a grant. There might be a state PFA grant, their local money. Um, so to, in answer to your question, we can use our funds, but this is also a state-owned facility. Um, and just like other state assets that come and receive bonding requests, whether it's a state park or other state facilities, usually state funds are used for those. So we're asking for the same consideration with the bonding request. Uh, Senator Nelson, follow-up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for that uh, explanation. 
uh, maybe one of our researchers has this, but how many other state golf, state owned golf courses do we have in the state? Usually they're uh, private golf courses or municipally owned golf courses. I'm not familiar with any other state owned golf courses in the state. Uh, uh, Senator Nelson, thank you for that uh, question. The answer to that is I don't know, but we will certainly take a, 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 a look at it. But I would naturally assume that this is probably the only one, is what I would naturally assume. But I I'll so. verify that. And it's my understanding that the U of M owns a golf course also. Thank you. Um, Senator Nelson. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for indulging the questions. I do think it's something uh, to consider um, that it, it is a state-owned golf course, but I'm just not, uh, I too share some of the same thoughts and concerns as uh, Senator Mohammed on this particular project. Thank you. Any other questions of the testifier before we go? Senator Drehein. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Mohammed for certain the questions up. Why are you acting shocked? Yeah. Are you, uh, are, are right. you acting shocked for some Just, reason? You know, I hate to say it, Senator Mohammed. You had the same thoughts that I did. So oh. um, pretty scary for you. But um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it looks like a wonderful golf course. I, I have not been up there to see it. Um, and I understand asking for resources for a state asset. That isn't my concern, um, even though it is lower on the priority list when I have communities in my district that don't have clean drinking water, and then we want $12 million for a golf course uh, irrigation system. Um, I, I think it'd be very interesting to see where you came up with the $12 million for a golf course that probably isn't worth $12 million to put the irrigation system in. Um, I happen to have a, a friend that owns a couple of courses, um, and I texted her and um, asked her what it would cost. And her numbers align with the article I read while I was sitting here. Um, and, and they said the average is between 750000 to $3 million. Extreme cases up to $5 million. Um, I, I will give you the benefit of the doubt and say extreme, but that's only five million, uh, not twelve million. So I, I, you know, we can debate the need. Um, I am going to recommend to the capital investment committee that we should take a priority over those communities that don't have drinking water, that are clean. I have some that have radium in their water, um, et cetera, and I kind of a broken record on this, um, but I, can you give me a little background on how it's 12 million and not the, the industry standard of, we'll even use the high end of their range, which would be three to five million? Uh, Commissioner. Chair, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, I do not have the construction documents and the bidding projects, but I know that when our, typically we use um, engineers to do estimates, I do know that this, with this facility, like it is underground water infrastructure, so we're talking about many acres being, and it, you know, taking out, replacing those pipes, and then all of the original valves, components, the old plastic. So I think it's just the size and the scope of it is where, where the cost is. Again, when we have done um, bonding requests in the past, like we, um, we would be asking for what we believe we need, and not something over and above. The cost Senator Jahan, follow up. You know, I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, uh, Chair. So I will just say I, I'm opposed to this um, dollar amount on this, and, and I hope we are not considering this over drinking water in, in my district for my communities. So thank you. Any other questions for the commissioner? Commissioner, I think you're going to stay, right? And then we're going to um, your colleague there, or at least uh, Shar Conger, uh, who is uh, the executive director for the Minnesota Discovery Center. Mm -hmm. So uh, please uh, um, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your, te your testimony. Thank you, Chair and Senators. My name is Shar Conger. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Discovery Center in Chisholm, Minnesota. 
Uh, museums in the United States are grounded in the tradition of public service. Museums rely on the public and are one of the most trusted institutions in society. Therefore, we need to maintain the highest level of accountability and service. The Minnesota Discovery Center is the second largest record repository in the state of Minnesota and the largest museum and cultural complex north of the Twin Cities. Our archives tell the history of our area and our research center sees document requests from all 50 states, more than 22 countries, and every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. We serve 50,000 visitors annually. We are the trailhead to the award-winning Redhead Mountain Bike Park, employ 70 full and part-time quality jobs, and have a $3.9 million direct annual economic impact. Today I'm presenting our full proposal request at $10.155 million to replace outdated existing infrastructure and construct new infrastructure at the state-owned asset operated by the Minnesota Discovery Center. I understand this bonding year has limited funds, and today while I'm presenting the full ask, I have come to start the conversation with a phased approach in order to take the necessary steps to protect our archive and repository collections. Specifically, we need to reconfigure and remodel the, to allow for more efficient and compliant compliant visitor spaces and replace our wet suppression fire system with a dry suppression system. We also need to replace outdated HVAC and climate controls in the Discovery Center's archival and record repository. As you can see in the photos on the next slide, we have a wet suppression fire system and multiple leaks in plumbing that have a gutter attached to the ceiling that drains into garbage cans. Most of our metal shelving that store our archives are tarped and due to inadequate climate control, the shelves are rusted and in disrepair. We are literally one false fire alarm away from destroying countless records and archives that tell the story of our people, our mining, labor, and land history. The center photo is a picture of our non-compliant, our ADA compliant bathrooms in our research center. These buildings are state-owned assets, and we are unable to provide inclusive services to all visitors with failing infrastructure and non-ADA compliant facilities. The last photo that I have shows the future expansion plans future expansion plans of our research center. Currently, we are over capacity and are not accepting any more archives. We, in fact, have a Morton storage building that we use to store historical, historical artifacts as overflow that is not secure, has no climate control, and has a history of break-ins. This new space would allow for more educational programming, capacity, and event space to educate the next generation of state history enthusiasts and build capacity to generate more earned revenue. As the new executive director, my team and board are committed to ensuring these state-owned assets represent the best of Minnesota to the thousands of annual visitors from around the world. The bonding dollars would increase efficiency by maximizing our footprint, increase energy savings, and create new space to grow historical archive storage and drive revenue. Our project significantly improves the quality of life in the region by connecting more people with their history and offering more educational programming. It will also improve safety and accessibility for our staff and our visitors by having our facilities more accessible. All of these impacts align our project with the governor's One Minnesota strategy. One of the most important One Minnesota priorities to the Discovery Center is children and families. This project will increase the opportunities for children and families on the Iron Range and across Minnesota by providing more access to educational resources and programming in a safe and compliant space. We have the unique opportunity at the Discovery Center to play a major role in workforce attraction and retention strategy on the Iron Range. Area businesses and industry leaders can hire, say, a welder for $100,000 a year, but if their families that relocate with them do not have access to fun, engaging, quality of life opportunities, they will not stay in our region. I know this firsthand. I was transferred 11 years ago to the Iron Range for a previous job. I struggled to find a connection to the community as a newcomer with no ties to the area. After meeting my husband, who's from the area, we decided to stay, and I made it my mission to find not only find my place, but to change the newcomer for the narrative for newcomers. I believe investing in this state-owned asset, the Minnesota Discovery Center, and improving our infrastructure, we have the opportunity to be an attraction stakeholder for families who call the Iron Range home or their home away from home while also driving tourism to our area. Thank you for your time and commitment to preserving state-owned assets and for creating healthy and vi vibrant communities. 
communities across Minnesota. Thank you so very much for your testimony. We will now turn to the committee, see if any member of the committee has any questions. Any questions? Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, maybe this was covered, but I just didn't see it. Also, just wondering uh, the type of uh, visitorship uh, that you have, how many visits per year. Um, you probably have a map showing where all they come from. I just think that'd be uh, important information too. To the testifier, Ms. Conger. Chair, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we do have uh, visitors from all 50 states um, and our research center um, gets requests from 22 countries. And like I said, all branches of the US Armed Forces um, get records from our research center. And annually we have about 50,000 visitors that, that come to the Discovery Center. Thank uh, you. Senator Nelson, any follow-up? No more questions. Thank you, Mr. All Chair. Right, any other questions from the, from the uh, body? Uh, CNN, thank you so very much for your testimony. And um, uh, Commissioner, I, I believe the Deputy Commissioner's last name is pronounced Bachinka? Bachinka. Sorry, Chair, it's Bachinka. He was right. You know, he and I were debating whether it's Bachinka or Bachinka. But we want you to know that he did a wonderful job when he was down recently. And we think it's important to always give a compliment, uh, as we will sometimes complain when we don't like something. So we wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Members, it appears from your uh, words, we'll uh, make sure that any information that we give to Senator Pappas includes your concerns. Uh, and so that committee can then make an informed decision as to what they would like to do. So uh, Tom uh, Melton, as well as Alexis Varner, has been you know, making sure they record this information. And so we'll make sure that your concerns are well known. Commissioner, thank you so very much for being here. And any closing comments? Chair and senators and committee, thank you for having us today. We really appreciate it and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, members, we're now going to uh, Senate file 3756. Uh, and that would be with Senator Hochschild. And just so you know, the Senator Hochschild is going to join us to present, to present by way of um, uh, Zoom. And we're going to ask the testifiers to come forward. And we'll always go to the senator first. So can we make sure that the senator is with us? There he is. Can you hear us OK? I can. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Thank you so much for joining us by way of Zoom today. Uh, we do, members, just so that you know that we have two testifiers at the table, Elizabeth uh, Waffle and uh, John Thornson, uh, and, and Thorson, I should say, not Thornson, Thorson. Um, and when it comes to your testimony, you can correct me if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, but we'll always start with the author. Uh, Senator um, Hotshot, it's my understanding that you have an A1 amendment. Is that correct that you want um, adopted? That's right, Mr. Chair. All right. With that being said, Senator Muhammad moves that the A1 amendment uh, be adopted. Members, any questions on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All aye. those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A1 amendment is adopted. All right, so Senator uh, Hachal, you can give us your opening statements and then we can go to your testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I'm not sure if it's by happenstance or by design that I'm here testifying after a lively Iron Range conversation. Uh, <laughs> but today I have before you Senate File 3756, a bill regarding water infrastructure. When it comes to clean water, our cities and towns are unsung heroes in Minnesota. Our cities ensure that Minnesotans have clean drinking water and that wastewater and sewage does not pollute our lakes, rivers, and streams. With aging infrastructure, increased regulations, and inflation, it's becoming prohibitively expensive to build and upgrade drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. Our communities could not do it without financial assistance from the Public Facilities Authority. The PFA's Water Infrastructure Fund grants and the Point Source Implementation grants are both important parts of the funding packages that local governments receive. For both of these programs, excuse me, but both of these programs have caps that have not increased since 2017. This bill and my author's amendment are fairly simple. They increase the size of the grant to reflect the inflationary pressures on our local governments facing, facing costs with these projects. It would increase the WIF grants to $10 million and the PSIG grant to $12 million. 
This increased funding will help our local communities afford these projects and move them more quickly. And with that, I do have three testifiers. One of them is online, um, and that's Doug Gregor, the mayor of Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Hoschel. Senator Hoschel, is, an, is there any particular order that you'd like your testifiers to present in? And they, they will only uh, be allowed to give two minutes of testimony. Any order? Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll allow you to go with the order that you presented earlier so we can have Elizabeth go first, please. Thank you there, Senator Hoschel. We have Elizabeth um, 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 well, Weifel and... Uh, it, it, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? It's Wayful. Wayful. Uh, it's like you so ate too much. If you'll be so kind. <laughs> Wayful, got it. Um, uh, um, uh, if you'll be so kind as to introduce yourself again for the record and give us your two minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee. Senator Champion, members of the committee, thank you. My name is Elizabeth Wayful, and I'm here testifying on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities in support of this bill. I also want to mention we've been working with LIUNA, the 49ers, and Conservation Minnesota on this bill and related bills. Um, Senator Housechild talked about the role that our cities play in wastewater and drinking water. Very important to um, keeping water clean here in Minnesota. And quite frankly, we couldn't do it without assistance from the PFA. Um, upgrading these systems is typically among the most expensive investments that our cities make in any kind of infrastructure. I um, just want to mention what these two grant programs are about. The, win the Water Infrastructure Fund provides grants to cities based on affordability. The goal is to provide assistance when a project would increase water or sewer rates above a 1.2% to 1.4% of the median household income. That means that when your uh, cost is, you know, on wastewater or drinking water is getting really, really expensive, um, these grant programs will help bring it down a little bit. And I, I need to point out that even with the grants, it is still very expensive for the residents of these cities. I think Mayor Gregor is going to talk more about that. So these grants are really essential for keeping rates in an affordable range. The Point Source Implementation Grant Program recognizes that when the state requires a city to upgrade their facility to meet new regulatory requirements, such as removing phosphorus or chloride, because that upgrade benefits everyone, uh, the state is going to step in and help um, as well. But the costs for these projects have um, increased dramatically. I'm sure Senator Nelson's familiar with that. I know it's been happening in her city and others ones like that. So what that grant program does is it helps meet the requirements of state regulations. And, and what this bill would do is increase the, that amount. Again, it won't cover the entire cost of the project. Um, these projects have really been escalating, so even that additional um, couple of million dollars will really help a lot of our communities um, to keep their rates so that citizens can afford it. Thank you so very much. That is your two minutes. Thank you, Ms. Whiteford. Um, and again, uh, we know that this is about increasing the size of the grants. Uh, and now we'll go to John Th uh, Th Thorson. Um, to give us two minutes mm -hmm. of testimony before we go to our last t testifier. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Thorson with Lyuna, Minnesota, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, we're Minnesota's infrastructure union, representing more than 14,000 skilled construction laborers who build and maintain the roads, bridges, and basic utilities our communities uh, need to thrive. Here today to support Senate File 3756, a proposal to fix our state's aging municipal infrastructure that's threatening the vitality of our communities, the safety of our drinking water, and the quality of the lakes, rivers uh, that we all treasure as Minnesotans. These investments allow communities across the state to repair wastewater treatment plants, stormwater facilities, and drinking water systems that are often at or near capacity or can be at or near the end of their useful life. This is critical infrastructure that allows communities to prepare for severe weather events, to clean up water contamination, and upgrade facilities to prevent pollution from happening in the first place. I also support this proposal because it will launch and maintain thousands of high-quality, family-sustaining, prevailing wage jobs for tradesmen and women across the state. We're very excited about the career and economic inclusion opportunities this brings to the Minnesota's construction industry. Both Lyuna and the Minnesota Building Trades are committed are committing more resources than ever uh, to connect women, veterans, people of color, young people to the promise of great careers in the trades through our registered apprenticeship programs. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to thank Senator Housechild for bringing forward this proposal and strongly encourage the members of the committee to support Senate File 3756 because it makes our communities more resilient. It'll create and maintain thousands of families supporting construction careers uh, for people in every corner in the state. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so very much. And if you guys can just hold there until we go to our third and final testifier, that would be Mayor uh, Douglas Greger. Uh, from Aurora, uh, and I believe he's online. Mr. Mayor, I am if you're there. Can you hear me? Um, we can certainly hear you, so please provide your, your two minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee. Well, thank you, Chair uh, Champion and uh, committee members. Uh, I'm here in support of the bill that we've just had discussed and maybe to provide a cameo focus of how it applies on the ground. Uh, I'm the mayor of the city of Aurora, but equally, I'm also the chair of an independent joint power entity known as the East Range Joint Water Board that's uh, commencing construction of a joint East Range water system that will ultimately be providing drinking water services for four communities and up to 3,500 customers. And I want to thank Senator Hochschild for introducing the bill. After more than 10 years of planning and fundraising, Bids for the $33 million East Range Water Project were finally awarded on February 2nd. And since 2017, uh, the year that was noted as the year in which the WIF statute was the last amended, the cost projections for our project have increased 92%. Uh, due to my community's exceptionally low LMI level of 32,287, uh, our project will receive a $5 million WIF grant to help finance a portion of our project costs. Officials at the PFA have indicated, however, that our project could be eligible for a significantly larger grant to help to reduce our project's crushing drinking water revolving fund loan principle. <clears throat> a WIF grant that's substantially in excess of $5 million if the uh, proposal before you is adopted and the cap is raised. The WIF statutory cap provisions quite simply have not kept step with the rising costs of water infrastructure projects of poorer communities like mine, for which the WIF grants were intended to provide critical financial assistance. I urge you to adopt the uh, proposed bill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your testimony. Committee, any questions for Senator Hochschild or any of the testifiers? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, as, as a member of the bonding committee, I know Senator uh, Nelson and I have, have uh, toured a number of these these projects. Oh, and Senator Housley, sorry, sorry to forget your way across the table. Um, but I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just wondering about why this bill is in jobs. Um, it's my understanding that, that we don't have jurisdiction over, over PFA, but I was just double checking that and What's the connection to jobs and economic development for where we're at? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, Senator Pratt. It's my understanding. I'm sorry. Are you in it? Uh, Ms. Nona. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, and Senator Pratt, um, the Public Facilities Authority is in the jobs and economic development budget. Um, they do. Re they received, I think, some special revenue funding every year, and then. Um, Last year got some general fund support. Any follow up, uh, uh, Senator Pratt? It, thank you. No problem. Uh, any questions for Senator Hochschild or his testifiers? Seeing none, Senator uh, Hochschild, you have any last minute statements before we lay Senate File 3756 as amended on, on the table for possible inclusion? Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, all has been said. I appreciate the consideration. All right, with that being said, Senate File 3756, as amended, will be laid on the table for possible inclusion. <laughs> Members, uh, we're going to have Senator Putnam come forward so that we can go to Senate File 4925. And uh, according to my records, we also have uh, Kerry Johnson, who's going to join him at the table. All right. And Senator uh, Putnam, when you're ready, please uh, 
Uh, state your name for the record. Give us your o opening uh, statements, and then we will go to Kerry Johnson, who is with the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. Sen uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, if I may add, uh, we do have an, a technical author's amendment that uh, I believe would be appropriate to offer uh, before I talk much more about the bill. Is It's quite simple. Changes a couple bits in language. Um, when you look at it, it looks a lot longer than it actually is. It's because it's changing the same phrase throughout the entire bill from tribal to tribal economic development uh, group. That's the, the, the main gist of the uh, technical change to the bill. The and amendment. Senator Putnam, that would be the uh, 4925A1 amendment, is that correct? Exactly, Mr. Chair. All right, Senator Putnam moves the 4925A1 amendment. Any questions on the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the A1 is adopted. Senator Putnam, to your uh, 4925 as amendment, as amended. Thank you much very much, very much uh, Mr. Chair and members for hearing this important bill. Uh, so from September 2023 to January 2024, MCCD convened a working group of economic development nonprofit organizations from across the state, various sizes serving uh, specific regions or communities. Uh, they undertook this process to ensure that the existing competitive small business programs indeed were working as intended for both entrepreneurs as well as the organizations delivering these programs. Uh, this bill here is a result of that process uh, and an effort to make sure that these programs are doing as they were intended. Senate file 4925 would make policy changes to four small business programs at the Department of Employment and Economic Development. First, the Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program. Second, the Small Business Assistance Partnership Program. Third, the Community Wealth Building Program. Fourth, the Expanding Opportunity Growth Loan Fund. Uh, these programs help nonprofit economic development organizations offer loan capital and small business technical assistance to entrepreneurs across the entire state. This funding is also targeted to serve small business owners and entrepreneurs that have a harder time accessing capital through traditional banks, uh, including black, indigenous, people of color, women, veterans, people living in rural areas, and people with disabilities. Um, Mr. Chair, we do have our, our one testifier who can speak through the, the bill, perhaps in its more technical senses, but by and large, this is a technical corrections bill. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Putnam. To the testifier, Ms. Johnson, if you introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your two minutes of testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Champion, members of the committee. My name is Carrie Johnson. I am the Director of State Policy and Field Building at MCCD. Um, as Senator Putnam mentioned, MCCD convened a working group to thoughtfully consider changes to existing deed small business programs and also to identify gaps um, to help shape future programs or legislation. Uh, the result is Senate File 4925, which has a few key themes. Uh, first, um, and probably more important, or most importantly, is to ensure that loan programs can be offered as fee-based loans to provide more inclusive financing options, um, cap interest rates on loan programs so that these specific loan funds cannot exceed 10%. Clarify that tribal economic development entities and community development financial institutions are eligible to access these programs. Streamline the underwriting process for the Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program by removing duplicative underwriting for certain partner organizations. Adjust the Small Business Partnership Program so that the grant can only be used to provide free technical assistance. Incorporate automatic loan forgiveness for borrowers in good standing for the two loan programs that have it in their uh, legislation. Ultimately, we hope that these changes will ensure that organizations around the state deploying these resources can better support the small businesses they work with and that those small businesses receive similar support or loan offerings no matter which deed partner they contact. Um, I want to thank DEED for their input and willingness to help um, it, with making some changes to these uh, programs, uh, make them work better for everyone. I want to thank all the organizations that participated in helping to shape this bill. And um, I also want to thank uh, Carlin and Tom for their help and support in this bill. And then lastly, Senator Putnam, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, any uh, any discussion from the committee? Uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, well, I was going through the uh, A1 amendment, and I appreciate the technical nature of that, as uh, Senator Putnam mentioned. But there are two things that I see in this amendment that seem far from technical, and I'd like to get some more information on them because they seem a little uh, concerning to me. And the first is line on line 1.11. 
uh, and that, that's the amendment line, and so on your bill, that's uh, page three, line 29. I'm concerned that uh, there's a loan portfolio, portfolio administration fee that currently must not exceed the Wall Street Journal prime rate plus 2% with a maximum rate of 10%. And I'm somewhat concerned that we're crossing out the maximum rate of 10%. So suddenly, um, it is 10% uh, is what I understand. And I would like, uh, I'm wondering if Senator Putnam might be able to discuss that change uh, a bit. Senator Putnam, to the question, or do you want that, or do you want your testifier to speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Nelson. Um, uh, our testifier would like to handle that. All right, uh, uh, Ms. Johnson, to the question. Uh, thank you, Chair Champion, Senator Nelson. Um, I want to clarify that the the intent, and perhaps it's written um, in a way that is not understood by everybody, including myself. Um, but it, the intent is meant to be up to 10% or not exceed 10%. Uh, Senator Nelson. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. That is not what the amendment says. And uh, so I would uh, move, uh, I would ask staff to uh, prepare the language needed, or I'll make an amendment to uh, reinsert the language uh, on page three, line 29. Uh, with a minimum, with a maximum rate. So there's three words that were uh, omitted with um, a maximum. I so can uh, I will I will ask the testifier to speak to the amendment, Mr. Chair. But that's what I would right. be making. So, so Senator Nelson, I think we want to make sure the council has that clarified, so we have proposed language that meets your objective. So I think your objective is for the language to say. Uh, a rate up to 10%, is that correct? Or well, a maximum of 10%? Uh, will, yes. Will you tell us what you yeah. what your intent yes. is yes. of the language uh, so that? Uh, my intention is to uh, keep the maximum rate of 10% with, with a maximum of 10%. So in other words, it could be 2%, could be 3%. Um, it would never be 2% because it's the prime rate plus 2%. So, so it's a qualifying, currently, uh, the first few words in line 3.29 are a qualifying a phrase that describes a limitation on not to exceed the Wall Street Journal prime rate plus 2%. And it's making uh, a qualifying statement there with a maximum rate of 10%. But when, if, we, if we strike the words with a maximum, um, then it could be 12% or 14%. Um, we've lived through some high inflationary times, and I'm, I'm concerned about uh, automatically increasing the cost for the loan portfolio or administration. We'll let Senate Council yeah. uh, speak to this. Yes. Senate Council. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair and Senator Nelson, I do, I do think there is an error on the amendment on line 1.10. It says, page 3, line 28, delete the new language. I don't see any new language, but it does say delete everything, strike everything after exceed. And so that means it would strike the Wall Street Journal prime rate plus 2%. Then on line 3.29, it would delete with a maximum and insert a a. Uh. So it would read, um, a loan under the subdivision must not exceed a rate of 10%. Do you, um, Mr. Chair and Senator Nelson, do you want it to read, under the subdivision must not exceed a maximum rate of 10%? I think it, it still is may not exceed a rate of 10%, so that would be the maximum is 10%. Yes. Does Madam, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Nelson, um, can you, uh, so does that make sense though that it does, um, there's nothing about Wall Street Journal prime rate plus two, um, there is an error on the on the amendment, though, with deleting new language. There is no new language. Uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, and thank you for uh, for that um, explanation. So there are t there are two issues. Uh, the one issue is yes, there must be not more than a maximum of ten percent. So, Senator Nelson, amendment. can we deal with one of your issues at a time, just so that we're clear? Unless you're saying both are about this this line three point two eight and three and, and three point two nine. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Chair. Uh, yes, they, they are related in okay. the fact that, um, but, but I don't care if there's two separate votes on them, they could be two different votes. But the other one, just so the 
the body knows, is that uh, we should keep that qualifier in there that says must not exceed the Wall Street Journal prime rate plus two. Why would we want loan portfolio administration to be able to uh, be a 10% cost if inflation were 2%? I'm, I'm just, which is our normal um, portfolio administration, I think, is 2%. So I'm just cautious. So I would like to return to the original language, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, rather than the um, language that was adopted in line 1.10 and 1.11 of the A1 amendment. So then we should be working, uh, okay, so just so that we're clear, uh, the A1 amendment has been adopted, so now you want to uh, go back and, 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 and you have a motion or you're preparing a motion in order to modify the language at 1.10 and 1.11 that would impact uh, the Senate file. Is that correct, Senator Nelson? Yes, Mr. Chair. I would like one point, the original language in 1.10 and 1.11 to be reinstated. Mr. Uh, Chair, if I may, um, from uh, my perspective and the perspective of uh, uh, Senator folks Senator uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the intention of both the amendment and its change and what I understand to be Senator Nelson's concern are identical. Um, both of these are efforts to cap the, the rate at 10%. Uh, so the question is merely sort of it's semantic or grammatical in terms of what language makes that most clear. But the intent is the same. Um, I think our advocates think that the language that we've adopted in the amendment accomplishes that goal. Um, so it's, it's up to the body, uh, Mr. Chair, but the, the intent is, the, is identical. So here's my suggestion. So Senator Nelson, um, uh, in the event that, that we include this language as, as a part of our omnibus bill, our policy omnibus bill, we would ask that you and Senator Putnam, along with counsel, uh, wordsmith so that you all are comfortable with the language there so it meets both of your um, uh, intentions. It, is that okay, Senator Nelson? Senator Nelson. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. It is, except I just want to be very clear uh, that it's not just keeping the maximum at 10% that I'm concerned about. I'm also concerned about decoupling it from the uh, Wall Street Journal prime rate. So I want to make, there's two, two, two issues there. Thank and, you. And Senator Putnam, uh, uh, are you committed to working with Senator uh, Nelson between now and Wednesday in order to make sure that this language uh, works? Um, uh, Senator, uh, so Senator Putnam, are you okay with that? Okay, Senator Putnam says okay. And it appears that uh, uh, Senator Pratt, did you want to be on the list or you have a question on this, in this area where we are right now? Mr. Chair, I'll withdraw my amendment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Senator Chair. Nelson. Uh, 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 Senator? Oh, I do have something to that point, unless Senator Pratt has something to that point. Okay, Senator Housley. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I was just wondering, too, what Senator Nelson was saying. I completely understand what she's saying, the Wall Street Journal prime rate plus 2%, so if the Wall Street Junior, uh, Journal's prime rate is 2%, then 2% above that would be 4%, and that's a big difference to a maximum of 10%. So I think that language is extremely important. I'm just wondering why was it taken out? What was the reasoning behind that to, to even strike that? All right, so we know that the language is going to be worked on but between the parties, but to Senator Housley's question, uh, Senator Putnam or Senator, excuse me, or Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Senator Champion, Senator Housley. So the uh, language, Wall Street Prime Journal, that is a request from the House author. I'm certainly open to discussions um, here in the Senate as well, but that was a request to incorporate it. Um, Chair Hassan is the House author and has requested to remove Wall Street Journal Prime from uh, these loan programs. Um, it is my understanding that that doesn't make a difference between the maximum of 10%, whether or not it's Wall Street Journal Prime or not. The whole intent is just to make sure that loan programs um, don't go above that 10%. And actually, I think there's an encouragement to set rates accordingly, you know, accordingly. So for example, MCCD's average interest rate on our loans right now is 4.8%. I think the private sector is right around probably 7%. Senator Housley, a follow-up? Senator Housley. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. I, I still, if it's 4.8%, then 2% above that would be 6.8%, but 
where it doesn't say anywhere in there to not go above the 6.8 if it was 4.8. So that 2%, I think, is kind of important language. But we can work on that later. Um, we don't have to hash it out here, but I think it's... We just have to remember to flag it so we know it's there. So, um, Carlin, help us. <laughs> Thank you. She is the magic word person, so she will help you all with that. So no problem. S Senator Nelson, uh, uh, listen, to that point, I think you had two points before I go to Senator Pratt. Oh, yeah, uh, I, Senator I, Nelson. I, Mr. Chair, I had another question on uh, page 17, so yes. if we're ready to move on, I'll bring that forward. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my other uh, concern on the amendment, uh, a, on the A1 amendment, which was, as the author said, very much just about uh, changing the language between uh, tribes and updating that with tribal economic development entities. I understand that. No questions there. However, there's another anomaly on uh, page two of the amendment, uh, line one, and that's where, um, well, I want, maybe the author could explain that a little bit, but it looks like we're striking um, the lender and instead insuti uh, inserting developed by the lender and the commissioner. So um, I, I just want to make sure it's actually yeah. adding the lender and the commissioner both would be in the development. I, I think that's how it reads, but I'd like clarification from the author on that. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, to the question. Yeah, thank you, Senator uh, Chair Champion and Senator Nelson. Um, this is language that was requested by deed, uh, just as a clarification that that um, criteria would be developed in partnership between the lender and um, the commissioner or the commissioner's staff at deed. No questions. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know how I love loan programs. <laughs> um, and, and my, uh, my questions are, are kind of along the lines of, of Senator Nelson's, but, but a bit different. Um, Mr. Chair, you, you've heard me say uh, on, on numerous occasions, right, when we look at interest rate, interest rate really does three things, right? It uh, covers the time value of money, which is essentially inflation. Um, it accounts for the risk of the loan being made. Not every loan gets repaid. There's a default rate. And... Uh, at least in the private sector, there's a, a, a sliver of profit that's that's built into there. Now, presuming that none of these have profit, um, let me talk about the um, how we've got this structured right now and how you came up with the, the 10%. Because right now, um, that would be under what current law allows for. Prime rate right now is 8.5%. And it's up from 775 a year ago, um, and that's considered the you know the 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 best rates that the large banks give to their to their best clients. Um, so it seems to me that we're we're trying to price these loans somewhat under what we might consider a, a relatively risk-free rate, um, taking into account the time value of money, what the Fed fund rates are, et cetera. Um, can you tell me how you came up with the 10%, why we want to reprice these loans below what would currently be available in current law? Uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Senator Champion, Senator Pratt. Um, I just want to thank you for that question and happy to do my best to clarify here. This was a discussion amongst, um, a pretty intense discussion amongst all of the participants in the working group. I would say overall CDFIs in Minnesota on average have their interest rates right around seven and a half percent. As they are non-regulated you know, bank entities, the mission and goal of lending is slightly different. Um, with banks, there is the um, outcome of trying to earn some money uh, to put back. With CDFIs, it's just to cover costs. And so I would say that that is part of it that is factored into setting interest rates. Um, also, this is just to set interest rates on these specific loans. It's not it's not for every loan in the portfolio that um, a CDFI or economic development organization might have. It's just for the, these state resources, essentially so that these organizations don't make profit off of the state resources. Um, so that's why we set that cap. I will say if we set this cap um, at 10%, Minnesota will be um, kind of an industry standard um, or setting the industry standard for the entire country with a 10% rate for CDFIs. Uh, Senator Pratt, any follow-up question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm just wondering if somebody from DEED can come up and help me understand this. 
Uh, anyone from Deed, uh, Deputy Commissioner McKinnon? And as uh, the Deputy Commissioner is coming, I want to remind us that the proposals that are articulated in this bill are from a working group that was convened by the Metropolitan <coughs> Consortium of community, de community Developers, and they sought to provide us with these recommendations that that's before us. With that being said, uh, Deputy Commissioner McKinnon. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, the way it's been outlined today, uh, obviously the 2% on top of uh, the Wall Street Journal prime rate uh, is the ceiling. Um, and, and we ultimately approve some of these loans uh, or these loans once the lenders make them. Um, and, and we've administered this program this way since 1994, I believe, when, when this program uh, originated. Um, I'm sorry, I f don't recall if there was a sp very specific question that you had of me, Senator Pratt. Y y um, Senator Pratt, you want to re well, reiterate it or you want me to? I'm thank sorry. you, Mr. Yeah. Chair and, and Mr. McKinnon. I'm concerned about the cap of 10%. What if the prime rate were to jump to 12%? And we're and and my my concern is one, we're lowering the rate from what's currently available today. Um, we don't know where inflation. We don't know where the Fed's fund rates are going. Um, I know that there's been discussion about a rate cut sometime this year. I'm actually somewhat pessimistic that that's going to occur because it seems one, inflation is stickier than than it is, and and two, uh, the labor market. Uh, is and, and tax receipts are stronger, showing that there's a lot of liquidity in the market that um, doesn't need to be um, uh, incentivized by a, by a lower rate. And so, my question is, what happens? How do how do you come up with with two percent above the, the the Wall Street Journal rate, and then how do you um, cap that at ten percent when theoretically we could exceed? 10% in the Wall Street Journal rate. I appreciate that oftentimes the loans are lower than that, but I don't like setting an arbitrary number. Uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, thank you um, uh, for that. Um, ye so yes, if, if the prime rate were to go to 12%, uh, plus two is obviously 14, and yes, that would cap it at 10%, uh, at so it would be significantly lower than what is uh, available in the private market. This funding traditionally uh, has been used in partnership with bank funding, um, and to a certain degree, to your point, um, is used and the interest rate is determined based on risk of the borrower, et cetera. Um, if it were to be determined that 10% was the standard rate and the rate was up at 14%, um, you could envision that um, a, a business, why would they go to a, a private bank for financing when they could get 10% through this type of program? That's for loans that are in combination. Generally, um, a lot of these loans that we're talking about here also are loans that are done directly by the nonprofit. And I believe it's 50,000 is the cap on loans that the nonprofit can do um, without having another private financing source involved. Um, and so again, uh, they would be capped within that 10% uh, 10 range, which if in the scenario where it was much higher, yes, it would be a lower rate. Similarly, if the rates are lower, um, as I think someone has pointed out here earlier, if the prime rate is lower, plus 2%, it's obviously a significant lower uh, cost to that. So uh, it would be basically capping the amount of, of interest that the uh, entity would earn uh, to use to administer the program yeah, at 10 percent. Uh, Senator Pratt, any follow-up? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. McKinnon. It sounds like you're making loans below that 2 percent threshold, and it seems that 
this cap is unnecessary. It's an unnecessary risk. It's um, and and it feels a bit arbitrary. And, and Ms. Johnson, while it might be in the range of what other states are doing, it doesn't mean that it's a good practice. Um, in that we don't know where the market for interest rates are going. There are way too many uh, uh, variables. And, and we already have the ability to price these below what uh, is laid out in statute today. I'm not seeing the, the concern around uh, why we have to have an upper cap when we don't know where inflation's going, we don't know where the Fed's fund rates are going, we don't know uh, we don't know what the risk of the individual entity is, as Mr. McKinnon said, that's priced into this discussion. Um, before I move on, it looks like Ms. Johnson has Ms. something, Johnson. and I would be happy to, to entertain her before I move on. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Senator Champion, Senator Pratt. Um, an additional part of these conversations, because there was some lending that was above the 10% uh, level, was to ensure that if a small business goes into an organization in northern Minnesota and Bemidji, they're getting the same type of access to resources and interest rates and supportive, you know, technical assistance as somebody down in the Twin Cities. That was another part of the intent, um, so that there was a cap. That is another rationale for uh, why we had these discussions. Um, and as I, as uh, Chair Champion mentioned, this was done by a working group and um, multiple organizations in the handout. You can see uh, who participated. Um, we had robust discussion on this, and that was our recommendation um, of 10 percent. Uh, Senator Brett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and while I appreciate that was the recommendation, I'm not sure who all was on the task force, who the lenders were. No, not yet, Mr. McKinnon. <laughs> um, I'm also curious, Mr. Chair, on uh, line 7.4, we have up to 10% of the loan's principal may be, or wait a minute, um, I'm in the wrong spot here. Um, we are now, at, uh, Mr. President, we're, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, we're adding a section on uh, line 8.8 .8 that now gives a 1% fee uh, to the originator to offset related expenses for loan processing, loan services, legal filings and reporting. And it's my understanding that when we allow an organization to take an administrative fee, these would be all the things that are covered. So I'm trying to understand why on line 9.15, we are also allowing a 15% 15 15 of the loans. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's forgiven. I misread that, Mr. Chair, but um, how, to Mr. McKinnon, if we're adding this this one percent um, fee that will be that will be given on every uh, closed loan, how are how are we covering those costs? And wasn't the interest rate intended to cover the cost of servicing the loan? Uh, 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 Deputy Commissioner McKinnon, uh, unless you want to go to Ms. Johnson, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, I think Ms. Johnson might have to answer. Uh, that on behalf of what what is in the bill, but um, yes, in other programs there are um, origination fees uh, and uh, the interest rates that obviously the partner organizations do keep. But Mr. Johnson, Johnson may have an answer for that. Uh, thank you, Ch uh, Chair Champion Senator Pratt. Um, so this change was made in the. Um, Expanding Opportunity Growth uh, loan, f loan Program, as well as the Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program. Um, the Expanding Opportunity Growth Loan, loan Program had put in a 2% um, origination fee, and we changed that to 1%. Um, most often, the borrowers that these organizations are working with do not have access to traditional bank financing. Um, so we're just trying to provide as much uh, wealth building opportunities as possible. So we decided we could split the origination fee with the agency. Um, I know the agency has some concerns over that, so definitely open to discussions about that in the future. And it sounds like you have concerns as well. Senator Brett. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, as, we, as we're playing around with the interest rate and moving it over to the fees and who pays them, you know, again, part of the interest rate is meant to cover those servicing costs uh, associated with the loan. And 
and um, now we're going to be forgiving uh, up to 15%, at least on this on this second version, um, in a revolving loan program when those payments are designed to replenish the revolving loan program. That's why we call it such. Um, I think this is a, I think this is a, Senator Putnam, I think, you know, some of the changes here are, are a worthy attempt to try to, to increase capital to some of our small businesses. They're still hurting uh, from the shutdowns that we forced them to go through, and I get that. Um, but from the banking standpoint, and having spent 30 years in, in banking and financial services, I'm extremely concerned with some of the structural changes that we're making, given uh, the rates to that, that we have and, and not having a solid footing on why we're capping them at a certain rate, um, understanding what rates are for, and why we're adding in um, new, you know, uh, new, uh, it wasn't fees, what's the word I'm looking for? It's right here. Um, uh, it is called a fee. Um, new fees on, on some of these that increase the cost of lending, potentially. Um, you know, if we know that, if we know that one percentage point of the, uh, of the APR is intended to go to loan servicing, then maybe we should change the, uh, the threshold to, to prime plus one instead of prime plus two. I, I, it's currently sitting at prime plus four, quite honestly. So, I mean, that's, that in and of itself is, is quite a change as well. Um, I'm all for making lending more affordable, but we also have to do it within the context of the current marketplace and where we're at with the drivers that are causing it uh, interest rates to be as high as they are and stepping in and artificially trying to lower them um, has a real cost and has a downstream impact. Um, I don't want to see capital dry up for this for this population um, and I don't want to I don't want to follow other states in the bad decisions. So uh, Mr. Chair I've got a lot of concerns on this as you can tell um, from forgiveness to fees to interest rate caps across the board. And uh, I think it takes a little, I think there needs to be more thought in this before this moves forward in any sort of omnibus bill. Thank you. So Senator Pratt, I would encourage you all to talk to each other to see if there is, uh, see if some of your concerns or questions can be addressed uh, and to see if there's anything that can be done uh, because our plan is to uh, potentially include this as a part of our uh, upcoming omnibus bill and we want to make sure that this committee has as much opportunity to lend itself into this conversation so thank you very much for your uh, raised concerns anything else before we go forward uh, Senator Joyheim I think it's a friendly amendment uh, uh, Senator Joyheim you know uh, chair it's hard because uh, the author of the bill moved farther away from me because he knew I had an amendment today. <laughs> um, but I, I do have the E2, Chair, but I, I have a couple questions before we get to that, if that's okay. That is okay. Senator Johan. I'll make it quick. Um, so on 2.14, I see we're adding um, some language to help pay for some expenses. Can we get an explanation why that was added, or what did they do prior to... Um, adding 2.14 through 2.17 of uh, the bill. Uh, to the testifier, Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Champion, Senator Dreheim. Um, this is language to add in that um, allocating this technical assistance on behalf of the state um, <clears throat> that grantees can use up to 15% for um, to help cover some of the associated expenses with um, providing that technical assistance. Before it was uh, negotiated in contract and it, I think, was up to 10%, um, and that is what is kind of the standard with deed. Uh, but I just want to reiterate that um, the 10% doesn't fully cover the costs associated with administering this program. Uh, Senator Johan. Thank you. I like Senator Pratt, I have a bunch of things circled, but I think I'll wait and see what comes of it uh, Wednesday. Um, which, is that posted yet? Um, it's not posted because we wanted to make sure that we had okay. this discussion uh, so that you can at least okay. have some interaction with each other. And then this is also provided as an opportunity for 
the author and others to hear any concerns around the table and see if they can get with some of you to see if we can, you know, resolve some of those complaints. Okay. I'll, I'll take or that concerns. up with I shouldn't call them complaints. They're concerns. With some of my concerns Senator with Johanna. the author. Um, you know, on, on uh, trying to find the page here, um, but it has to do with the reporting uh, being kicked out a year. Um, I don't know if, if the author or Ms. Johnson could explain um, why, why we're pushing out the reporting back to the agency a, a, a year. Um, Page nine. Uh, uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Senator Champion um, and Senator Dreheim. This is a request um, from MCCD. We are named to pilot the Community Wealth Building Grant Program. Um, we just signed our contract um, in November of last year, and so the program is just getting rolled out. There is no data to report on, so we want to ensure that we can provide actual information for a report. Um, that is the reason for pushing it out a year. Um, and then making the change um, on line 9.21 um, from January to December. So we do internal audits annually, um, but they do not get completed usually until the uh, mid to end of April. And so um, this was just a change to the recommendation of um, House Research, uh, who drafted this bill, um, to put it to December instead of January. Senator Jaheim. Thank you. Um, you know, you, I, I would have submitted a report saying that we just signed a contract in November and we don't have anything to report, and then that would have been the report. I think that's, that's I think that is what we uh, have done. Because oh, sorry, you, uh, you have to not interrupt, and you have to give me an opportunity to recognize you. I know you're excited. We love your enthusiasm, <laughs> but we want to wait until the question has been asked. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and I. Um, it's semantics. I, I just think it's really important that um, as we continue to expand all these programs and have more and more of them out there, um, we need to make sure that we know what's being used efficiently uh, as I think funds tighten up in the coming years. Um, we need to have that data. Uh, no matter if there's bumps in the road or not, we just need to know it. Uh, with, with that, uh, Chair, I'll offer the A2 amendment. Uh, Senator Johanneim offers the A2 amendment, and before I let Senator Johanneim discuss the A2 amendment, Senator, uh, excuse me, Ms. Johnson, you were going to, you were saying something while Senator Johanneim was speaking, so now I'll give you a chance before he discusses the A2 amendment. Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, and apologies, Senator Champion. Um, Senator Johanneim, uh, I believe that is what is the, um, there is no information to report is what was submitted. All right, Senator Draheim to the A2 amendment. Uh, chair, members, uh, same type of amendment that we've had in the past. Um, just more reporting back to um, the, the leads in, in the committees for transparency purposes. Uh, I, I know, I think uh, both parties have worked very hard on this the last couple years trying to get more transparency to the public, um, and, and this would do the same thing. So I urge everybody to vote yes. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Draheim. Senator Putnam to the A2 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Draheim. Um, I uh, obviously was anticipating this, uh, given my, my rude joke earlier as an intervention, and yes, I'm, I consider it friendly. All right, any uh, discussion around the table? Committee to the A2 amendment. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and A2 is adopted. Any other questions, um, members? Seeing none, here's what I would encourage you to do, Senator Putnam, as well as your testifier. Um, um, I would, would encourage you all to get with Senator Draheim, Senator Pratt, and Senator Nelson, and of course with our counsel and and Tom, so you can walk through and talk about what our identified concerns, whether you accept them or not, that is up to you all and or to do that, but we try to make sure that we do as best we can in order to bring about some sort of consensus. Uh, and if you do that expeditiously, because we have our 
um, policy bill, our omnibus policy bill coming up on Wednesday, and I'd love to at least know where we are and adopt any language that has been agreed upon um, uh, and so that the bill is in the shape that you would like for the proposal to be in, okay? Uh, can I get that commitment? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Thank so, you very much. Thank you so much. With that being said, uh, we will now lay uh, Senate file, let's see, 4925 on, on the table for possible inclusion. Thank you for your patience today. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for being here today. All right, members, now that we got you revved up and you're ready to go, we are now going to go to Senator Muhammad. Uh, we now will go to uh, uh, Senate file number 3164. And as she's approaching the table, I thought it would be important for me to put in context what's going on with this particular bill. 3164 is going to be used as a vehicle bill. Uh, just so you know, and I believe the time had the, the, the opportunity to talk to Senator Dreheim. One of the things that we always try to do in this committee, we don't believe in trying to ambush you or do something that we don't uh, talk to the, uh, uh, the minority lead about. Because uh, we like to be as transparent as possible. Uh, and just so that there's clarity, um, we did make Senator Joham aware of the unusual path that this bill is taking, given the jackets for this bill, and have, they have not been received as of yet, and, and we will not receive those jackets in time for the deadline. So what we wanted to do was make you aware of this as soon as possible, and we wanted to make sure that the information about this bill will come before this wonderful body. And so we posted it, it's my understanding, and we provided Senator Dreheim um, for knowledge of this, um, this path about this bill. So we will take as much time as you need in order to make sure that you have your minds and hearts and, and hands around it. So with that being said, uh, before the body is Senate File 3164, and there's an author amendment which is identified as the A1 amendment. Does everyone have the A1 amendment? And so Senator Muhammad moves the A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Uh, the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Muhammad, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and so we'll uh, allow Senator Muhammad to have opening uh, statements. And then we have a testifier. I think we have... Uh, we only have one testifier, so that's good. All right. So, uh, Senator Muhammad, any opening statements before we go to your testifier? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the DE amendment adds prevailing wage requirements to multifamily affordable housing projects subsidized by tax increment financing TIF or low-income housing tax credits. Supporting prevailing wage is fundamentally a policy choice. But a policy, a policy choice that publicly subsidized uh, projects should support good paying jobs with strong wages. In addition, prevailing wage requirements can be a tool to deter problem contractor, contractors whose business model depends on misclassifying workers paying cash wages to avoid oversight of minimum wage or overtime standards and other labor, labor violations, including workers' compensation fraud. Prevailing wage requirements include documentation requirements which are simple to complete for contractors with good labor practices but, de but deter contractors whose business, model, whose, whose business model depends on exploiting workers from even bidding on projects. Um, these affordable housing projects are not, currently, uh, are not currently covered by prevailing wage requirements. Recent, and recent uh, research from North Star Policy Action has identified projects receiving over $80 million in public support that have used contractors with a history of wage theft, over, overtime violations, retaliation against uh, workers, and have sought to use workers' compensation and more. We should have high expectation for the contractors, uh, contractors that are benefiting from public subsidies for construction. Committee members should also know that third party and peer reviewed research demonstrates that prevailing wage requirements do not increase project costs and have also been shown and have also been shown to lead a fewer construction delays, more durable and quality work and fewer worker injuries. Um, I have a testifier with me and we will take questions, Mr. All Chair. Right. 
Thank you, Senator Muhammad. Usually I take some real grand attempt at attempting someone's last name, but the last name that is before us is even a little more confusing. So I'm going to let the testifier identify himself for the record and uh, uh, go forward with his two minutes of testimony. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Testifier. Chair and Senators. It's easy if you're not looking at it. I'm Richard Kajewski, the Director of Government Affairs for the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. I'd also like to thank Senator Muhammad for carrying this bill. Members, if you get the chance, I would urge all of you to take a few minutes and scan the research conducted by the North Star Policy Action last year. It highlights the unfortunate problem we have with many contractors who build affordable housing projects. Many of them have a history or a record of cheating and exploiting workers. On low-income housing sites, this has become far too common. In fact, since 2016, the research documented 14 projects that received $53 million in TIF subsidies alone and another 25 projects that received approximately $31 million in low-income housing tax credits. That's a total of $84 million in taxpayer subsidies on only 39 projects that was provided to unscrupulous contractors. This legislation requiring labor standards on TIF and low-income housing tax credits will go a long way in ensuring that workers are paid prevailing wages in their area. Prevailing wage laws like these have been proven to increase apprenticeship training, provide more job site safety, boost productivity, reduce injuries, and grow middle-class job opportunities. This legislation would also level the playing field for honest contractors and increase prevailing wage opportunities for local workers who spend their hard-earned hard wages in the communities where they work. What this won't do is fill the pockets of for-profit developers and contractors who rely on taxpayer subsidies while exploiting workers. Just last week, an OLA report revealed that misclassification in our industry has grown from 15% in 2007 to 23%. We simply need to do more. Members, Minnesota, without a doubt, has demonstrated that they're a leader in protecting workers. There's a growing need for these types of home building projects in our state now, and there will be in the future. All right, to the testifier, Thank unless you. you got one last sentence or line, uh, we'll end your testimony. Yep, this bill will finally close the books on two more types of projects that have been exploited by bad contractors, uh, looking to gain a competitive advantage in an industry that promotes the lowest bid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the testifier, I do have a question. Sometimes uh, there's this belief that uh, by putting uh, prevailing wage as a requirement on TIF, uh, that, uh, and, and, and when you think in terms of affordable housing, that by utilizing this tool of pre prevailing wage on those TIF projects would increase cost. Can you speak to whether it increased costs? To this justify. Mr. Chair and members, there's been a lot of research done on the costs of prevailing wage on public projects specifically. Uh, the, in 2021, a more recent study was done by the International Journal of Employment Relations that showed there's a modest cost. Uh, and there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, concern about the way that that study was done. However, in those cases where there, there's a consensus that prevailing wage does not impact costs, because three out of four studies conducted between the years 2000 and 2018 found that prevailing wage laws have no effect on the cost of public construction projects, which also reaffirms the study done by the OLA back in 2007. Any questions for the testifier? Senator Drahan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Mohammed, for bringing this up. Uh, for the rest of the committee, we heard this same bill in housing, and now it's going to be rejected with a different number. And prior to that um, hearing, I had sent an email to uh, Senator Mohammed asking more or less for a local impact uh, statement or a bunch of questions on the local communities that this would affect. And uh, if anybody wants to follow along, it's statute 3.987. Um, and it's a hardly used um, statute, but anyway, it's on the effect of what it would have on our local communities. And um, uh, the, the comment by the testifier, modest cost, I believe 
the last time you presented this, you, you had used 15% um, as a cost. And I think I said 30 to 50% is what we heard from the nonprofits that do work in this area um, across the board, across the state. 30 to 50% added cost to the projects. That is less units. And, and as we've heard in the Housing Committee, uh, we're short up to 100,000 units. And now we're gonna reduce that by a third. I'll take the low end of the spectrum, what we heard from the nonprofits uh, over the last six years, seven years, um, time and time again, what it would add, including on Governor Deaton's task force uh, for housing that me and uh, I believe Senator French served on. Um, we heard the same thing back then, and, and that was years ago, Chair. Um, you know, I, I think without data from our local communities on what the effect would really be on, on this. I think it's premature to move this bill forward, uh, Chair. Um, you know, we don't know what the actual cost would be. What improvements would it be to society? Um, you know, we hear about the wage fraud. Um, that would be breaking the law. Not meeting minimum wage, which I find hard to believe when you can go to any restaurant or any store across the state, I have seen 15 to 20 bucks an hour posted on the front door. Uh, for them not to meet the standards of almost half that for minimum wage for any job, I, I think would be improbable. And if it's happening, they should be prosecuted. We also heard, um, not today, but in previous um, conversations on this concept about bad actors, unsafe conditions. Once again, we have a state agency called OSHA that is supposed to enforce unsafe labor practices. So if, if we have bad actors out there, we should take care of them and, and uh, close them down if they are, are not following the, the rules. So, uh, Chair, I, I have a hard time with, with this short notice bill, as you can tell, and I'm, I'm sure you anticipated by my amendment that, that I did offer or shared with the committee. Um, <clears throat> I would like to offer that amendment at this time if it's appropriate, um, and I believe that would be the E3. Uh, Thank you. So we're going to first deal with the A3 before another issue. Um, does everyone have a copy of the A3 amendment? Me too. Uh, can we make sure that the others have a copy of the A3 amendment? Sorry. And while the A3 is being passed out, it's my understanding that uh, Senator Dreheim is also re requesting or going to have Senator Pratt request uh, a local impacts uh, note under 3.9. Um, and that was brought to my attention. Is that your intention, uh, Senator Pratt? Well, I just want to make sure <laughs> that you all are. I said the same thing. Okay. Um, uh, members, we will deal with that request and, and, and what is the best way for us to deal with it going forward. Okay. Uh, but now before us is the A3, and we want to, I want to make sure that everyone got a copy of the A3. Everyone's good? All right, Senator Dreheim, to your A3 amendment. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for making sure everybody had a copy of it. Um, so the, the, the first uh, part is line 1.3, uh, which just changes the date. It pushes it out a year so we can gather more information about the impact of, of this language. Um, and then more reporting, uh, like we've done on every other bill, um, 
transparency to the public. Um, and then an analyst of the prevailing wage requirements on construction costs. So we need to analyze what's going to happen, what is going to do to construction costs. So we, when we are building this affordable housing, what, what is the impact? How many fewer units are we going to be able to build? Um, and then the uh, prevail, uh, prevalence of construction employers paying prevailing wage. How are we doing that? Um, look at how that's structured. So that's pretty straightforward. I urge everybody to vote yes. All right, any questions on the A3? Any questions? Senator Muhammad on the A3 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Draham. Ms. Senator Draham, for bringing the amendment. I appreciate it. I know you're being thoughtful. I can't accept this amendment. Um, I do apologize for the lateness of this bill. We've been waiting to get a language for a while. Um, there has been a number of studies that have already been done um, in terms of prevailing wage. Um, and in terms of the date change, there is far too much exploitation going on. And so we need to do this sooner than later. And so I do appreciate you for bringing the amendment forward today. I can't accept it, but I'd love to continue working with you through it. Uh, any other discussions? Just so the committee also knows, in the event that uh, this uh, bill uh, passes, it will go to taxes, and that's where it will be. And, and then any other financial issues can be um, certainly brought up there as well. Any other questions or discussion on the A3 amendment? All right. Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. The motion does not prevail. All right, we are uh, now still on 3164. Any other discussion about 3164? Uh, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and um, Mr. Uh, and I hope I pronounce it right. Uh, Colonel <laughs> Jeske, we've um, talked a number of times. It seems like a lot of this is being based upon the North Star policy actions um, uh, study, and I, I found it interesting because I'd never I've never heard of this organization. So I uh, I looked them up. Um, while they claim to be uh, nonpartisan, it was reported in the uh, in the Reformer that uh, they are a new progressive think tank uh, aimed at you know aimed at policy recommendations. That it was. Um, formed by four regional labor unions, Education Minnesota, IBEW Local 232, Minnesota AFL-CIO, and LIUNA. Nothing against these organizations at all. Um, I think everybody's got a right to organize and, and uh, uh, consolidate their voice uh, whenever possible. But I think it's interesting that we're citing a study um, on this, and, and maybe you can help me understand um, when it was funded by the very people who will benefit from it. Um, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a necessarily objective study, and maybe you can help me understand, because it uses the word exploit or exploitation or some, you know, some version of that about 44 times in the report. Um, maybe you can help me understand um, why you're relying on this report so much and um, what examples of how we think uh, workers are being exploited um, and how prevailing wage will help uh, remedy that. To the testifier. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, I can tell you why I relied on it. I provided you uh, specific figures from the report. Um, and those figures stem from a lot of significant work that, as you know, uh, is being done in our office and other offices of labor around the state of Minnesota. Uh, I can, we could certainly sit down and go through this report, and I'd be happy to do that with you, Senator Pratt. The people cited in this report, some have been prosecuted. It's public information. It's not a secret. The number of job sites and the amount of taxpayer subsidies that have been received on those job sites is factual public information. That's not something I 
drummed up here for this afternoon. I can tell you that the number of workers who've been exploited on these job sites has been years and years and years of work done, uh, including affidavits taken from workers, including video testimonials taken from workers, including uh, actual factual complaints that have been given to the Department of Labor and Industry. That's where that information stems from. And how that, that pertains to prevailing wage, I think it creates a transparency. Uh, prevailing wage creates a transparency on these job sites. Um, it's going to bring in uh, workers who are making a good middle class living, who've been through an apprenticeship, who are trained, and they're going to create a lot safer work sites for that. Senator Brett. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for that. And I don't think we disagree on the fact that there are people that have been and, and are continued to be uh, mistreated. That was one of the reasons I was the author of the wage theft legislation that passed back in 2019. Um, if, you, if you earn a wage, you should be paid that <coughs> wage. I don't see how this protects from wage theft. Bad employers are going to be bad employers. When I look at this report, it talks about workers being misclassified as um, independent contractors. We already have a law for that. I don't see how prevailing wage is, is going to remedy that. Um, we, it talks about human trafficking. I don't know how prevailing wage is going to remedy that. We already have laws on this. As Senator Dreheim said, we want our job sites to be safe, and um, we have been supportive of Men OSHA uh, for many, many years. We gave them additional funding in many cases to, uh, to enhance their services, and we just recently increased the penalties to try to be a bigger deterrent uh, for bad actors. And so I would love to go through the report with you. I, mm -hmm. I think, um, I, I don't know that this is, I don't know that this is the report that I'd be relying on um, for this particular bill, just my opinion. Um, but I, and, and I would like to see what maybe a, um, a nonpartisan um, uh, analysis would show if there, if there is one. So, thank you. All right. Uh, to the testifier briefly. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Pratt, my response would be real simple. Um, what I cited in my testimony and what I stand by in this report and why I think it is a valid report is I'm using objective data, not subjective data. And so as much as I appreciate that, and, and we can certainly uh, talk much more after this, I'm, and I'm happy to do that. But it, this. This diminishes the race to the bottom, and we're using public dollars to exploit workers. And so it takes away that tool. It, it opens up the collection of certified payroll and those reports, which is not happening on these job sites now. All right, thank you so much. Any other questions to the testifiers before we uh, go forward? And remember, members, uh, um, if this bill passes, it goes to taxes, and there could be any and all robust discussion in taxes about this bill. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll look forward to seeing this in taxes or not seeing it in taxes. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that, um, depending on what the, how the chair chooses to handle that, but I, before we leave this discussion on TIF, which is a tax discussion, I think we would be remiss if we did not note one of the criteria for TIF to be in place, and that is the but-for test. So but-for the TIF designation, this project would not happen. And I think that's an important distinct, uh, I think if you're going to talk anything about TIF, you have to at least acknowledge that the but-for is required. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nelson, and I know that you know a lot about taxes, and I know you can't wait to see it there, and I can't wait for it to go there. <laughs> so any other discussion from anyone around the table? Seeing uh, Senator Muhammad uh, 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 moves that uh, this bill be recommended to pass uh, and, uh, and be referred to the, the Committee on Taxes as amended. I was just reminded, as amended. No. Did we? Yes, we did uh, the, the amendment. I'm sorry. As amended. Any questions on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. 
Okay, let's try this again because you, you, you guys should wake up a minute here, okay? <laughs> All the, those in favor say aye. Aye. Right. All those opposed say no. No. The motion prevails. Uh, 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 Senate file number 3164 as amended is passed and referred to taxes. And that's where it should be. Thank you so very much. Now, members, uh, I want to recognize uh, former uh, State Senator John Harrington, who is with us, uh, and it's always good to see another member uh, of our great body. Uh, and so we really do appreciate you. Members, any questions about anything? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the discussion, members, today. Um, Wednesday, uh, can you just walk through what, what to expect and... Um, and if we're going to get our proper, proper notice on the bill on Wednesday? Absolutely. So, members, once we con conclude our business here today, on, on Wednesday, we're going to hear our omnibus policy bill. You heard some of the policy issues uh, today. And remember, we had that, the 6D bills that we already talked about already. Um, and then we'll have a handful of other bills. But our policy bill will be our main focus because we have to mid, uh, make first and second deadline. Uh, that is what we are planning to do. Senator Drehan. Uh, Chair, I think I'll let Senator Pratt go first. And then I'll Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, the, 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 the rationale for having three days of posting and making sure the, the information is out there uh, is, is really twofold. One, that we can do our, you know, we can do the work that we need to do in order to to analyze the bills and, and understand what's going on, but two is to make sure that the public has clear visibility on what's being proposed. And by posting a bill sometime this afternoon fails that three-day test. Um, I recall when you were ranking member, I posted a bill late um, and you made those very arguments uh, with me on why we should delay the hearing. and. And I actually agreed with you, we delayed the hearing. Um, it's been a common practice of the majority uh, in many committees, and, and you and I sit on one where you've heard this speech uh, on multiple occasions where we are not getting proper notice. The public's not getting proper notice on what's being discussed. And so, Mr. Mr. Chair, I would suggest that we follow the three-day rule. Uh, we have time this week. If we have to reschedule this meeting to a different day, we reschedule this meeting to a different day. But um, the majority in general has been, has been playing fast and loose with this rule, not following it um, to, the, uh, to the letter and the spirit of why the rule was created. And, and um, I would hope that this committee under your leadership, Mr. Chair, as it always has been, um, would be more cognizant of, of making sure that we are doing transparent work as we just heard about in the last bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Senator Johan, before I make comments to Senator Pratt. Senator Johan. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just, you know, the minority might have suggestions in this bill that you're coming up with on Wednesday. And I just want to make sure we have time to go through them. And with what, four other bills? I think there's a total of five on Wednesday, um, if I remember right. Um, that doesn't leave a lot of time for us to, for one, go through the bill and understand the changes that have been made from all the other bills um, and then have amendments um, and then have some discussion and then most importantly, have comment from the general public. Uh, that might be affected by whatever we're, we're trying to change. So I, I, I hope um, we can uh, um, leave time, if your intent is to ram it through on, on Wednesday, uh, for testimony. And I, I just don't see how you're going to do that with four other bills. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So let me just be very clear. Thank you. I always appreciate your comments because I'm always a person who likes to hear uh, any concerns raised by any member of the, com the committee, especially the, the minority. Uh, just so that we're clear, the different provisions that will be in our omnibus bill have already been heard and posted in the past already. So there's nothing new that's going to be in that bill that one doesn't know. 
Uh, we will provide time for amendments. If there are any amendments, I hope that once it's posted and you will get three days. So if, if you want, once you see it, uh, if we want to count three days from uh, when it gets posted, I don't mind doing that at all because I want you to be able to have as much time as you need to look at it, evaluate it, and make any comments. Uh, and we will always provide opportunities for the public, but I'm very certain that we're not going to have much public uh, conversation because there hasn't been much public energy about those technical and sometimes very um, nondescript uh, policy changes that we are putting forward. And I hope that you would probably use a different word than ram through because I don't ever ram anything through. I think I've always been very thoughtful and very helpful, and I've always tried to adhere to any of the rules uh, and any of your concerns. So it would probably be helpful if we put words in a different way as opposed to ram through that because that seems to suggest um, one doing something without any due consideration and any due uh, thoughtfulness uh, to anyone else around the table. So with that being said, any other questions, we will make sure that we post it. If it's not posted today, we'll make sure that you get three days and then we will find the time in order to um, uh, make the changes as possible. And last thing I'll say, I know in the past when something's come up, when people have been busy or there's not been enough time and I've made a commitment, I've always honored that commitment. I've never tried to do anything that would circumvent you because you are equally as important to me as you are to yourselves. So I want to thank you so very much for that. So anything else from any member around the table? Seeing none, we have conducted our business for the day. I hope you appreciate all the comments that have been made. And now the committee is now adjourned. Have a wonderful day.